Hey Dude, The 90s Call, with Christine Taylor and David Lasher. Welcome everybody back to the Hey Dude, The 90s Called podcast. I am David Lasher and I'm here with my co-host. Hi, I'm Christine Taylor. We have a great guest, but let, let's uh, recap Lisa Loeb. I thought she was amazing and so smart and like really did it her own way, right? I mean, she yeah. was so cool. No, that was such a great interview. And there were so many things. I mean, I just knew really uh, uh, sort of of her. I didn't know her. And I just like kind of woman to woman, mom to mom. Like she was so relatable. Like she was just and just bright as a like this bright light. And, you know, I just love that she's got so many things um, going at the same time, because I really feel like that's what it's all about. Like you can do it all. You can be a mom, you can sing, you can act, you can do voiceovers. I'm happy for her. Yeah. She adjusted her career as her life dictated, right? When she had kids, she started doing voiceovers. Yeah. And one thing I picked up on too, that I thought was really interesting that we didn't quite like elaborate on with her was how back then doing it all, like you really had to have a focus. And the way she talked about how she has her eyeglass, you know, her eyewear, Right. Like it, you were not taken seriously if you had a product to sell. Like it really is true. I remember that. I mean, yeah. I remember it was sort of not, it was a little more fret. Like you weren't take. it was like you were selling out. And I feel like right. that's so absurd to, to capitalize on, you know, your look or your style or whatever it was, you know, um, because it's so different now. So I thought yeah. that was really interesting. There's right? no selling out now. People respect yeah. The money. Yeah. Well, you, you said know? like the entrepreneurship of it all, right? Yeah, like, right. Selling out is now becoming <laughs> entrepreneurial. Yes, That's what yes. it's become. Um, yeah. So I, I was uh, very, very impressed with her. And um, yeah. And how Ben Ben gave her like, I mean, really jump started and made her gave her a number one song. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, that reminds me. I wanted to tell you this on the air. <laughs> that Ben Stiller, who's our our biggest Hey Dude the Nineties called fan. He's officially our number one fan. It's <laughs> hey, official. Sir, our, our number one guest. Yes. But he also um is just really casually the other day, he's like, Hey, you know, if you guys ever want like me to pop on as like a sidekick, just to sort of chime in on some conversation. He's like, I- I'm so jealous of these conversations you're having with people. I would love to be there. Oh, he, Christine. He, it was so funny. He's like, you know, like a like a Robin on the Howard Stern show or the Fred. <laughs> I could be like the Fred where I just chime in every once in a while. Um, oh, man. Tell him anytime he wants to. We I can know. do like a like a, you know, like a remote written bit with him every week. I mean, oh about God. the 90s. It's so, it made me laugh so much that he he so wants in. He wants in on our jam here. And I was like, yo, back off. This is our show. Um, <laughs> but, right. No. Let me let me let me direct uh, severance. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah, I'm not going to direct severance. No interest in that. Um, but uh, yeah, I just he really has uh, been enjoying it. And so, yeah. And so let's let's talk about. Our guest, who is now our first guest to make a second appearance. Speaking of second appearances, Scott Wolf. Yeah, well, well, Scott showed up late to the White Squall reunion, and I know he felt really bad. It was a scheduling thing, uh, but we're, we were so glad to have him. But there's so much more to talk to him about. I mean, we'll, we'll go into White Squall, but Party of Five in the 90s was so powerful. I remember, I mean... Yeah. Did you watch it? I did. I I did. And and our and, and of course our our hey dude writer Lisa Malamed was a writer on right. the show. So that was yep. uh it was nice getting to um I felt like I got a little bit of the inside track on the party of I behind the scenes with Lisa because oh, I was really into the show. But right. um I Dig also deep. I also really uh one of the things you brought up with uh Joey was that I think Scott also like what you talked about it experiencing a little bit as that teen heartthrob. And he was not a teen in the nineties at that time. I don't think when he did the show, but he was playing younger, like he's always looked younger, but he was really like came onto the scene in a way that like the girls went crazy. So yeah, he's always looked younger and he, he still looks younger. And uh, yeah, he, he, he was a very serious actor. I mean, from, when he showed up on the set of White Squall, he was on a 
a different plane, maybe because he was um, the lead of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but we were a bunch of, you know, <laughs> idiots running around and, and Scott was like very focused. And he always has been from what I've, our friendship, he's been very focused. Did you know him before White Squall or that was when you met him? No, but that was, you know, uh, 93, 94 yeah. or whatever, right, right, you know, almost right after I moved to L.A., Yep. We we've been friends ever since, but I remember thinking this guy is he was a little older than us, but he was he was he was there to work, you know, he was very focused. Mm-hmm. Scott Wolf is just seriously also one of the kindest people, like just a really good guy. I've met him a few times over the years. I don't know him at all, but he really has always been that person who just seems like the like he is who he presents to be he just seems very very genuine i'm really excited to uh to hear from him i was looking through this uh white squall book because jeff bridges uh is a, is a renowned photographer and after every film you know he makes these books wasn't he looking for that book when when he yeah. came on, I feel like he was looking for something he goes oh i wish i pulled that out but that's um that's incredible that's that. So he had that book made for the cast. Yeah, he he makes this on every movie. I mean, he signed it to me. What what did he write here? Hold on. He wrote, David. It was great, uh, great work. I dug hanging with you, bro. Best, Jeff. <laughs> wow. Oh wow. Scott's coming in. Scott's coming in. So you guys can talk. You can, you can jumpstart this. Hi. There he is. Hi. Scotty Wolf. He's here. Hey, everybody. How are you, buddy? I'm really, really good. I had a ball with you guys last time. I gosh, the the whole calendar thing and turning up late was, uh, turning up late for you guys was was terrible. Turning up late for (laughs) Sir Jeff Bridges was just- (laughs) Well, that's, yeah, I I was going to say, you can turn up late for us anytime. Um, He he was like, where's Scotty Wolf? That was the first thing he said, because he had seen you. He had seen you at the awards thing, like a couple nights before, right? That's right. And we talked about it and I said I was going to be there and he was hoping to be there. So uh, I was glad to get in on it. And uh, what a cool one. How, after all these years to revisit that, that, that great old movie. It wow. was such a great, yeah. I mean, we want to definitely go into that, but there's so much more to talk to you about and you're such, uh, we're so happy to have you as, as, as your own guest. Um, where, where are you? Are you in uh, Canada? No, I'm in Park City, Utah. At the moment, uh, wow! Yeah, working, yeah, yeah, yeah. working. No, my uh, my wife and kids and I lived out here for man for sixteen years, and then um, went up to Canada to to do the last show I was working on during uh, during the pandemic, and now we've moved back here. Wow! So you got out of Dodge well before pandemic time. You were like, we're getting out of, I assume, LA. Y- yes, although it wasn't it wasn't like an active choice yeah. to leave LA. Um, I went to work on a show called Everwood. Um, of course, back, of course. Yes, yes, in the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. I know we're supposed to talk about the 90s. <laughs> no, but yeah. this, 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 <laughs> All decades this, are this, welcome here. <laughs> okay, good, good. So yeah, it was the early 2000s and my wife and I just got married. And uh, I had done a pilot with the guys, uh, Greg Berlanti, uh, who did uh, Everwood and and he had this great idea for a character. And so we came out here thinking, we'll just you know, do a year in, uh, in Park City and get back to Los Angeles and just fell madly in love with this place and, and stayed for a long time. And now we've been a little bit all over the place the the last couple of years, um, uh, went up to finish the last few seasons of Nancy Drew, uh, that I just finished up on and, um, which was a great experience. And yeah, yeah, congrats on that show, man. People love it. Thank you. Yeah, it was a, a nice run. And, uh, the last season actually, I think uh, premieres our final season next month. Um, but yeah, great, great four year run, which, you know, as you guys know, that's, that's not, uh, they don't give those away easy anymore. <sighs> that's yep. for sure. Amazing. That is for sure. So yeah. And now we're, uh, yeah, back home here. Got the kids in school back stateside and, uh, and here we are. So you, are, are your kids like amazing skiers? Do you guys ski all year, all winter? We do. Yeah. Oh. They're all pretty, they're pretty great. They, none of them really, they all at various points did, um, the thing that you do when you live in a ski town, which is, you know, your kids sort of have to dip their toe into the like 
racing competitive thing. Oh, boy. Yeah, I was not an Olympian nor suspected of ever becoming one. Oh, no? <laughs> no, my wife wasn't either. Um, decently athletic, but, um, but you know, you can't swing a dead cat in Park City without hitting an ex-Olympian. So, oh, man. so the, kid, the kids are on teams with all these, you know, with these kids with like deep pedigree. And um, so they just, they love skiing. They love the mountain. They love being outside. Um, but there's no uh, ski racing in their future, which is absolutely fine by me. Yeah, I think as a parent, that's where you can take a deep breath and say that sort of eliminates um, obvious broken bones that will that's happen right. in the very near future. That's right. yeah, well, what a great activity Ooh, for them. Is, it, is, there P, is there PE class like uh, skiing? Well, yeah, the, every Friday they get off half day yeah. and they, and they get to go to the mountain they bus all these kids up and they take them to the mountain so they uh, during the the thick of the winter they do uh yeah they oh, do that's so cool half day school half day ski which is pretty awesome and um yeah amazing amazing to have access to that kind of that kind of recreation and the kids love it and we love skiing as a family and so yeah it's pretty great and then you know eventually the the snow melts after uh <laughs> you know being around for a long time and this has been a bananas winter it's been so snowy so i think it'll be june by the time anybody's you know on bikes or anything but it's right but then you start biking and fishing and hiking uh it, it's All got a great yes. lifestyle yeah and we you know we've come back and forth to la constantly and uh, we're in, we were in New York for a little while. We've been in Vancouver. Um, so, you know, we're, uh, we're in the circus, uh, <laughs> in the but, circus, <laughs> but we're, we're getting to a point now where, uh, you know, our oldest is now in eighth grade. And so, you know, we're doing our best to just kind of hunker down and let him, uh, have some consistency and all of us, frankly, have some, have some more consistency, but, you know, dad is still going to have to, uh, you know. Go where the work is. Go where the work is. Should we talk White Squall or or Party of Five? Which came first? Mm. Party of Five came first. Party came. Party of Five. I was on Party of Five for. I want to say. But I started in 94. So I think it was a, the not the first hiatus, maybe, but the second. Um, the first hiatus was quiet because uh, no one was watching the show yet. Um, oh, was, so was, crazy. Was, it a, uh, was it a late starter party of five? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. People sometimes forget that, you know, it eventually did pretty well, obviously. But we were the the best show you weren't watching on TV guy. Oh and, boy. And, yes. Oh yeah. I mean, early on we would show up, you know, I think we uh, eventually we moved to Wednesdays on Fox, but when the show first premiered, we were on Mondays and we would come to work on Tuesdays, like click. Okay. The lights are on. We can still, <laughs> we still have jobs. We still have jobs. <laughs> we have a show because nobody really had found us yet. And um, it took a little bit of while, you know, it, throughout the course of the first season, we, Built a little bit, a little bit, but we were very endangered between seasons one and two. It was kind of, you know, we had a, a guy named Sandy Grusha was the president of Fox at the time. He was a huge fan yep. opponent. Mm. So he kept us around. And to his credit, you know, that patience eventually paid off. But in our second year, we got nominated for a Golden Globe. And we went and we were, you know, <laughs> they sat us like by the men's room. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but you guys won, right? Oh, we won. Yeah, we won. yeah. It was like a shocker because we were up against all these, you know, uh, God, was it ER and Chicago Hope and uh, wow. Big Fence, all these shows that were expected to any of them could have won. And uh, when we finally won, it was really funny. I've told this story, but like the people who were announcing it, they you know they list all the names of all these shows: Pick and Fences, <laughs> Party of Five, like whatever. And she opens the envelope and she's like. Party of five. And he goes, whoa. <laughs> like, <that>. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Which, you know, is like not great award show <laughs> etiquette, you know. Not really. That, uh, that, so that you, you push the bathroom people out of the way. <laughs> yeah. It took you 10 minutes to get to the stage. Yeah. A hundred percent. And we lost our minds. And But so that, from that point on, it, it definitely was, that was a huge boost. And, um, and then each year we kind of grew and grew and, and eventually we had this really lovely following. But yes, uh, it was definitely the little show that could. But Scott, you know. was that 
show, like, had you been sort of pounding the pavement? Because I, I, you know, know you did episodes of a lot of sitcoms. Blossom, mm-hmm. you've added to we all. We've Seriously, all everyone that. we've had on here has, has done an episode of Blossom. <laughs> I, I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I had quiet dreams of taking your taking over for you. Guys. <laughs> uh, um, had no, you been yeah, pounding I, the I, pavement for a while? Was it, um, or was it? Did Party Five come pretty quickly? I mean, it's it's a relative question, sure. right? It's, it's, it's so it was three years mm-hmm. from the time that I hit LA, mm-hmm. and but I had been doing the, the pounding the pavement. You know, I was doing commercial work. I uh, I was in a Frosted Flakes commercial. I did McDonald's and Coca Cola. All these. Uh, tons of commercial work to get started and and get on sets. And when I first got to town, I did extra work on a ton of um, half hour shows. And my big thing was like, I had never stood on a set before. Right. So I just wanted to, I knew a time would come when I would be given a chance to have an acting role. And I just didn't want to not know what everything meant, you know, what back to one meant and cut in action. And wow. You know, so d- were um, you doing extra work and just studying everyone? Like you yeah, were like just film watching school. and a hundred percent. I was that weird, you know, background extra guy <laughs> who wasn't like listening to his Walkman or reading a magazine. You were taking notes. Like hovering over the AD, <laughs> like taking notes. Excuse me. And that's what, what, what a what, boom is. <laughs> yeah. What are you do? What are you doing yes. now? <laughs> yeah. Like that thing you're holding. <laughs> Back off, dude. Someone get this um, kid out of here. <laughs> get this kid out of here. But it was huge. You know, I did Fresh Prince of Bel Air and Life Goes On and all these great, like, 90s shows. Um, and, yeah, I was just kind of paying attention. And it and it really did pay off because by the time I was given a chance to, to have an acting role, so much of that process and, and the language of it and the momentum of a day was just kind of, familiar a little bit more familiar to me than it would have been sure and it just made and it made you know a young actor's job who is just scared to death you know deer in the headlights trying to just get my two lines out <laughs> without throwing up on myself uh, <laughs> it kind of simplified that process because a lot of the uh yeah a lot of the the bells and whistles that that could be in your way as you're trying to sort of you know fight to understand what's being expected of you. I had experienced a lot of that through being an extra. So I actually encourage that for anybody who's, um, you know, coming to LA and starting an acting career, just find your way onto a set, you know, and get, get yourself some experience so that, uh, you know, if, and when hopefully, you know, you're given a chance to, uh, to, uh, to act in something that a lot of those extra things are, won't have to be things you're trying to figure out on the floor. Right. And take your yeah. headphones out and start watching. Cause I mean, I spent years on sets where I just go back in my trailer for hours, yep. you know, and just like time goes by where, you know, I got, as I got older, I would, I just stay on set and I watched. You, know, you grew I, out I, of your diva days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, going to my trailer. Yeah. It got boring, man. You know, hours go by in those trailers. You're like, what? It's dark now. <laughs> yeah, and I started late. You know, I started after college, which felt a little late. You know, because I'd be in these audition rooms, and you know, um, there were tons of people in there that had been doing it for a while, and so you know, the casting director would come out and be like, you know, oh. Yeah, hey David. Hey, oh, hi Alan. And then she'd be like, "Uh, Scott." You know, I was like, "Oh, yeah. <laughs> wah, wah. So oh, I always, far yeah." Um, You're right. You're like, I'm already at a disadvantage. I'm already at a disadvantage, but so yeah, I did that a lot. I I took even party of five. I mean, mostly party of five. I kind of treated that like my film school, you know. And uh, I was, you know, always on set. I was always asking every kind of person every department questions about what they were doing and i would watch dailies from stuff we had filmed which you know for anyone who's listening doesn't know is like basically the previous day's footage they would let you watch dailies i was very friendly with our our dp okay because actors they don't they don't like actors watching true they do not they do not (laughs) they don't they don't want you like calling them up right i don't want to use Take five <laughs> from take three. That yeah. angle is terrible. Exactly. My chin. <laughs> yeah, my chin. Yeah, my chicken chin. Never shoot me like that again. Uh, I'm skipping the next two days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
getting plastic surgery. <laughs> um, but yes, I think I think um, there there are a lot of reasons why why the uh, the the muckety muck don't want us uh, seeing ourselves on film. But this guy um, was was awesome, and he knew I was really studying the craft, and 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 I, I think for me. As a, uh, I was a new to being a film actor. I was working on TV, but uh, working on film. And so this idea of I could watch things close enough to my sort of memory of what something felt like to do. And, um, and then you could see how that translated one way or another. And, um, funny enough, the biggest lesson I took away from it was just like stop being self conscious and paying attention to what you're doing and just live things out. Because every time I was like, oh, that scene. Oh, that was a good one. I can't wait to see that one. Right. And I'd go watch it on the truck and I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, God. That's cringy. It's cringy. It's so cringy. That's not what I did. I was not in the moment. I was too, no. too like self aware. Right. You can't. I was, a, I was an actor just connected. I was like, dot, connecting my dots. Hit there, that moment. I think that moment. And there's, so there's no harder job or better training than a one hour drama series. Right, because they're like shoot, you're shooting a little movie every week, yep. uh, but instead of shooting two pages a day, you're shooting you know eight pages a day, and mm -hmm. you have no choice but to move on and let it go. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's that's very well said. Yeah, I think it 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 it, uh, it strengthens a couple of the most important things um, if you want to, I think, approach the work uh, in a healthy way. One of which is go on instinct. You know, you can't. There's no time to overthink things, really. And you have to trust yourself. Right. That can be really hard, you know, especially as a young actor where you're trying. I wanted so desperately to, like, do right by these people who have given me these this amazing opportunity. Right. But, yeah, you know, you just have to you just have to throw yourself into it and be as honest as you can. And um, and and, yeah, it's it's a great training ground for, you know, you get on a. A film set after that like when we did you know this might be a good segue to get get on to uh, white squall but white squall was the first big film i did after i had started working on party of five and yeah you know i think um obviously you know you're you're taking on a lot less in terms of script content every day right so everything is just bigger you know you're shooting more expansively and there's a lot more camera coverage especially with and the your life might be in danger for two <laughs> months straight quite possible <laughs> you're <laughs> yes you're risking life and live every time you walk on this set uh whether it's like a sailboat or a tank or a like yeah a, vo a volcano a volcano <laughs> one of your castmates um there were risks everywhere uh but yeah so i i think um it's it's almost like TV uh, hour drama feels kind of like heavy lifting in a way. So that you know, um, if you can shoot eight pages of heavy dramatic stuff in a day, then when you get into an environment where you're only shooting two, um, it feels like you can uh, spread yourself a little wider and, and breathe, and maybe breathe a little breathe. bit, take a breath. Yeah. And yeah, I mean that schedule though for the one hour, you know, the single camera is. I mean. How many years did you guys do Party Five? Because that's grueling. That's right. Those, it's a lot. Twelve to are, fourteen hour days, right? Yeah, I mean, back in the day, we, it was very, very uncommon to shoot less than fourteen. Um, I mean, that's insane. Yeah, it was a lot. So that that was, and I, you know, I kind of went drama to drama to drama. So, mm -hmm. you know, I went, you know, I mean, I've got most of my my career working on hour dramas. I I, I would love to do more comedy, but um, but. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it is a tough schedule. You know, it's, um, it's, I, I never complain about it because I see the crew work that tough schedule yep. and they're there before us, you know, shiny made up people yep. and after we all go home. And so, and how about your writers, man? I mean, party of five had some amazing writers, Christine, you want to tell her, tell Scott, one of our favorite writers. <laughs> One of our writers from Hey Dude, Lisa Malamed, yeah. wrote, ah. she was our, you know, we, we had her on the show on our first episode here for this, but she was like, she was sort of our on-set person. Like she was with us in the trenches 
and sort of almost like, what did she call it? Like an older, she didn't say older sister. She maybe said like older cousin or something, but like she was really older than us. She was the adult in the room. Took care of us. Yes. Her and Graham Yost, who right after Hey Dude wrote Speed, um, you know, we had these two amazing, we had several amazing writers on this Nickelodeon show, but do you remember working with Lisa? Oh my gosh, of course. Yes, she was. I mean, she's an incredible writer. Um, yeah, we were, we were, it was an embarrassment of riches on that yeah. show. You know, I think, you know, Chris Kaiser and Amy Littman who created it, uh, but Lisa and PK Simmons and, um, oh my gosh, Susanna Grant. I mm-hmm. mean, we had, we had so many uh, incredible writers and that was, you know, I, I didn't take it for granted at the time, thank, thankfully. I, I, I kind of, even as a, a a kid who was on his first sort of regular series, I was aware of how lucky we were to have all those people, Lisa, in, uh, very much at the top of that group. Um, and, you know, it just makes everything go. You know, you can't uh, you can't make anything great without um, without the material. And they so sort of gave us characters that were consistent Mm -hmm. and somehow indelible and unique you know you don't they didn't feel like anyone else um yeah and they and as we grew as a show you know they they grew with us and and really understood who we were as our characters and so um what a gift that was i mean uh i've been lucky to work on things over the course of my career that um that have been written really nicely and it makes all the difference in the world. I mean, there's there's not enough you can say about the value of great writing. And that's why it, the sh- I think, you know, to all of those points, why the show was so beloved by so many. And, you, you know, you guys became the viewer's family. And, and just when you can't get invested in those storylines, if there's no, if they're not based in reality and some, you know what I mean? If there's no truth to it and you well, were getting that from the it, writing and, and the but performances. But it was a very... Uh, a very yeah, dark yeah. jumping off point, right? I mean, the show was pitched as these kids who lose their parents, right, in a car crash. Well, what's what's interesting about it, that, that there's a kind of a, a humorous uh, side to the lore of the of the founding of the show, which is that apparently Fox first pitched to Chris and Amy a show that was no parents, but it was more like. Uh, we don't even necessarily need to know right at the beginning why the parents are gone, but it's just like <laughs> kids on their own. And it's like parties at the house and like a, you know, animal house, but with a teenage family in San Francisco. Oh my mm-hmm. God. It was intended on being a kind of a, you know, wish fulfillment for teenagers. And what they got was party of five. Oh, <laughs> the complete yeah. opposite. It was so, it was heartfelt and, and you guys tackled a lot of deep issues. It was deep. It was not, yeah. The keg came out of the pitch and tears came in. Uh, right. Death came in. Uh, orphans <laughs> came in. And um, yeah, it was, um, I mean, look, they, they, they leaned in hard to uh, a teenage audience uh, at that time that, people weren't really writing seriously and authentically. Right. It was, it was a 90210 type of world. Yeah, they, yes. the yes. And not that there was anything wrong with that. No, no, no of course not. Because it served a, a, a huge um, uh, role and that show was incredible and entertained people and it had indelible characters of its own. But this, this, what we were doing was taking on, you know, real issues that people weren't comfortable that even talking about necessarily. Exactly. Um, and, um, you know, with alcoholism and teen pregnancy and, and um, you know, kids being orphaned and under the threat of being sort of absorbed into the state system. Mm-hmm. And so. Right. A cancer a, diagnosis. Cancer. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, it was all very, very um, serious and earnest. And, and you know, hopefully we, we skirted melodrama, but it was, you know. Before we would do takes of lots of scenes, you know, Chris and Amy would like lean out from behind the monitor and they'd be like, tears would not be inappropriate. And then they'd like, (laughs) (laughs) no pressure though. The tagline, tears would not, no pressure. That's basically no pressure if they don't come, but we'd love it if they do. (laughs) And our our rap gift 
for one of the seasons, either for the first or second season, were these little Tiffany silver uh, tissue boxes. <laughs> oh, stop. Oh, I thought it was, you know, you know, that thing they squirt in your eye? Oh, oh, the, the, the menthol blower? The, <laughs> the menthol, yeah. It's like I'm crying in two seconds. But I do have to say that the, the thing that came together on Party of Five, and it's why, you know, I still get stopped on the street for whatever, I mean, close to 30 years later, is that the the combination of the fact that the 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 cast you know that this group of us for whatever you know cosmic reason the second we stood in the fox offices and they said congratulations you're the salingers uh we looked around and it was like yeah we are you know we are there wasn't like oh are we i guess yeah you kind of look like my brother <laughs> that might work and I, we haven't really met. Hi. It was all. It was already like, oh yeah, we are. So that familial thing that was just born of the chemistry of who the four of us were together, mm-hmm. um, and then eventually our our various incarnations of Owen. Um, <laughs> I think that combined with a writing staff that was committed, like to authenticity and honesty and pushing boundaries and telling truthful stories about characters of that age Yes, that, that you could watch whether you were of that age or, uh, you know, any age beyond that. Um, and the stories hold up, you know, there's something about great, great, great writing. You know, I get stopped all the time by people who are telling me they're watching the show now with their kids and the stories still are relevant and, and they still spark great conversations about, Life and, yeah. Um, well, like you said, it was the first happen. of its kind to address, tackle those sort of taboo issues that television was not really meant for. Now it happens so much more often. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I feel like you guys were the, the template for that. And, um, it's, a it's a special show and what a great thing yeah, to be a part of really such yeah. a solid, you're right. When, it, when a cast like that with, I mean, there wasn't a weak link in, out of any of you, and that's meets magic. Up like that's a magic with a writing right? staff. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it the, doesn't happen very often. No, and and the people who would come through the show. You know, if you go through IMDb and you see all these people who came through the show as guest stars, just some incredible, incredible actors that have gone on and had you know ridiculously great careers. Um, and um, and you know, I mean, things like you know, uh, uh, Carol O'Connor. I mean. Played our grandfather. Right. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Right. Oh my god! Archie Bunker. Archie Carol- Bunker. You know, oh, I didn't kid, remember that. The Smithsonian. Wow. Um, oh my so there were there were gifts like that all all throughout it, and um, so yeah. Look, the show has followed. I think all of us around for the last thirty years. Sure. But to be followed around by something that meant so much to us and meant so much to the people that watched it is just has been a joy. That's so terrific. So that what so White Squall was your did you do anything in that first hiatus or that was just like chill out time and then and then the success of the show came and Yeah, I think um I think I just sat in a room and praying that it would hope and pray (laughs) that we would get to do another year. I mean it it was truly heartbreaking to think we knew what we were making, right? Mm -hmm. We knew how much potential it had. We knew how it felt to be on set and telling these stories and the writers that we had. And it was like, gosh, the, the, I mean, the idea that they could just be like, you're done was so, um, it was terrifying. Oh, I bet. Truly, you know, I had never been part of anything like that. Scott, and- how did you get six months off of your show? I mean, White Squall was, they don't shoot movies that 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 length anymore. I mean, we, we were they gone for months. Yeah, I mean, we didn't, if you remember though, we didn't shoot, the whole shoot lasted six months, but there was um, like that whole South Africa episode that we did where we had to yeah. find the big waves. Yeah, at the end, yeah. Um, that was later. I had already come back and started working on, uh, back on uh, season, I guess, maybe three of Party of Five. Right. So I think it was, I, we just used the entire three month, you know, what did we have? Two and a half, three months. I asked, uh, I had, to, they gave me, they pushed up me off a little bit in the beginning of the season so I could finish. But yeah, that was an incredible shoot, right? Because we were in, you know, we were in the West Indies and then we were, went through London to Malta and eventually wound up down in South Africa for a little bit. But um, yeah, 
I was grateful they worked it all out, obviously. I, what an listen, I, I remember what, you showed up on the White Squall set and maybe it was because you were the lead of the movie or maybe you were a couple years older than us, but whatever it was, you came very focused. Mm. I remember you had, you had your jump rope. And you're like, this is all I need. I, I, I'm going to work out every day. Remember the jump rope? I do. I do. You're like, this is all you need for a proper workout. I don't know what I had watched or read up until that point. But um, yeah, it served me pretty well. I, I got to say, though, I hit a, um, there was a moment at which, uh, you know, the we, we talked a little bit about this from, on the White Squall podcast uh, that you guys did where where we got, I got hurt, you know, we, we were running down that volcano. The side oh yeah. That volcano, right. And I got hurt and, uh, I couldn't jump rope. No. I, was no. I went to hell in a handbasket. And hey, Christine, we were, we were shirtless in every scene. I know you were shirtless yeah. in every scene. I watched it. You'll notice uh, 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 Chuck Geeg's t-shirt started to stay on after the Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the broken rims and the- A little rubber yeah, tire rubber. started. <laughs> That's right. Scotty, I'm just like, uh, I'm, we're going to post some of these. Okay. But I was telling Christine about the oh, yeah. books and, and the uh, photography that Jeff does. So and here's cool. just a photo of Scott Wolf playing guitar oh. by the dressing rooms in Malta. I love that. Look at those baby faces. It like brings me right back, like it was yesterday, man. You know, totally, totally. Um, What a great time, right? It really was. It was. I, you know, Jeff was saying they don't make movies like that anymore. You know, it would all be kind of CGI, and we'd be in front of green screens. But uh, it was uh, for me. It was like my college experience. You know, because I, I I came to LA and and for. I, I didn't go to NYU and that to me, you were my frat brothers, basically. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that there was a, I don't know how much of this we talked about uh, that last time, but it did feel like, you know, art imitating life, imitating art. You know, we were, we were older than our characters, right? We were, none of us were in high school, but, but we had an off camera experience and bonding and um, ups and downs and, you know, crazy adventures and, uh, you know, thankfully, none of <laughs> there were no no uh, fatalities in the end of the off camera part of things. But um, <laughs> no, I mean, Ryan and Ethan did not hold back as no. far as you know. No, what, we, what went on? We probably had as much. I, we had more fun than our characters. <laughs> <laughs> I would have well, to yeah. say, and it was yeah. I mean, to take you know, you know, talking about how films were still made in the nineties and you know, just the adventures you would get to take like that. And um, even things like technical things, like I remember being in the West Indies and, you know, this is a little kind of wonky, but, you know, in my kind of trying to pay attention and learn as much as I could about different parts of the, of the craft and of filmmaking, um, I, I found our editor, you know, in that, that first little, we stayed in this little hotel in St. Vincent, right. right? It was like a little horseshoe shape with the beach out front. And I found out he was cutting the movie as we were shooting it on an old flatbed, you know. Right. Cutting and splicing like old school. Wow. So I would just go in there and watch him sometimes. And, you know, it was another one of those get this kid out of here moments. (laughs) (laughs) I I bothered a lot of people. I was going to say, I think this is the through line. I think we're getting to know who Scott really is. (laughs) Like you're you were that guy always. It feels like that's right. (laughs) Like as you guys put this podcast together, I'm going to be over your shoulders. Honestly, I tell my I tell my son all the time yeah. that intellectual curiosity mm. is one of the most important things. I agree. You know, like he has friends that might not be the smartest or the best students, but they're uh, you know they're watching documentaries and they're on a uh, master class and they're just curious yep. about the world. And that sounds like how you approached uh, your your intro and and your acting career. You just you know, you, you wanted to be in the middle of it. Yeah. I always liked to think that I was a, a curious person and, and, you know, sometimes I think we can, uh, it's very easy to be myopic with your curiosity and just go, well, I'm just going to be curious about the things that I like the most. Yes. Um, <laughs> but I think it's, I think it's important is kind of, if you can kind of stretch those boundaries and, um, you know, I knew ultimately I'm not going to be a film editor, you know, 
But I really was curious about that process. And it was fascinating. And to be honest, you know, right on the heels of that, almost no one was doing that anymore. You know, everybody's on computers and on the Avid and and that process is what it is. And it's incredible uh, in its own right. And I've I've, bo- <laughs> I've bothered a lot of people working on Avid <laughs> um, standing over their shoulders. But to get to stand over this guy's shoulder and watch him cut film the way it was cut from like the very first film that's ever been made and knowing that he was like taking this to Ridley to, you know, watch in his hotel room every every night was really really cool and you know you talk and about probably the last year or two that you could have even witnessed that that's right yeah that's right and i think that's what you know to me i i'm i'm personally nostalgic for the 90s for lots of reasons you know i think i came up at that time you know we all did and and um but there was something i don't know people all talk, people talk very much about the 70s you know in terms of uh popular culture and music and uh, film film and how those films and the, the songs and the bands are indelible and will stand the, the test of time. And I agree that that's absolutely true. I mean, some of my favorite films and TV shows and music is still very, very much rooted in the seventies. Um, but I, I, I would put the nineties in, in a conversation about it being very special and unique in very different ways than the seventies were. Um, but there was still uh, somehow kind of an innocence in the process of how people felt making all this stuff. And um, right. there was happened. nothing innocent about the 70s. It was <laughs> no, it was no. it was hard, <laughs> hardcore protests, riots, drugs. That's right. But great work came out of it. But yeah, the mm-hmm. 90s was was a much more innocent time. Yeah, I it, was an, it, is, it was a way more innocent and, uh, you know, stress free, peaceful uh, time in our culture. And I think that that had its say in in um, in the art and the, the the music and the TV shows and the films that were made during that time. And um, yeah, we were saying that um, about the comedies, too. I mean, it was a very, very specific period of time comedically in film that you don't see off. I mean, into the early 2000s as well, but you don't see the movies that are pushing boundaries like that anymore. I mean, we talked right. to Ben a, a lot about this when we had him on and yeah. you just can't make some of the movies he made back then now. And thank yeah, God we have yeah. them. Thank God those, those still exist to, you know, represent what that period of time was. You know, I think you're right. Does he, does he think or represent that, that there's a, a sort of a pendulum effect or, 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 or does he, do, do you guys think that those, uh, the appetites for those kinds of things might, are, are gone forever somehow. I I think personally, I mean, and, and yeah. you know, we do talk about it is I think there is a little bit of a pendulum effect. It's just yeah. how much you, you, there's just certain things you can't put out there comedically okay. anymore. Okay. However, right. the sort of, you know, the quintessential rom-coms or, you know, what those were in the nineties yeah. that we sort of steered away from things became much more sort of like R rated raunchy kind of shock value comedy yes. instead yes. of those classic, you know, nineties romantic comedies that we all remember. But I do think the pendulum swings a little bit. It's just what the, it's, it's how, how, how much you can push the envelope comedically right. anymore. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that's really what well said. I, I I totally agree with that, and I I guess I guess the thing that I that I I I love laughing at myself, and I love when we can collectively laugh at ourselves, and it feels like you know we're in a time where what version of laughing at ourselves is okay and what isn't, and it's totally understandable because you know to to be moving into a time where we're more careful about about things that are hurtful to people or about things that are you know unnecessarily uh, um i don't know narrow or some such thing i i i guess i just um i'm a fan of human beings being able to enjoy um 
our frailties. I, I think the pendulum definitely swings both ways. Mm -hmm. And I mean, can you imagine pitching all in the family now, a character like Archie Bunker? <laughs> that's right. That's right. But, but he made fun of everyone. He made fun of every ethnicity. He was myopic. He was, he was racist. Yes. And, and, uh, he, was, and he was drawn by people mm -hmm. who were trying to do the opposite thing. They were using the absurdity of his racism. To point out the absurdity of race, right? Mm -hmm. Right. He was he was the joke, right? He was the joke. Rob That's Reiner, right. Meathead, well, he could not explain. You know, he, he just couldn't understand this guy. That's right. But but people weren't offended by uh, you know the stuff that Norman Lear wrote. I don't know. I think at some point someone's going to come out with uh, a comedy, and it has to be funny. Yep. But it's going to press the envelope, and it'll be successful. There's a couple people doing it in stand up. You know, that, yes, mm -hmm. the last that, truth tellers are the mm -hmm. stand ups. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they're, they're kind of equal opportunity. Uh, they just they go after everything and everyone in themselves. And then. Um, but, yeah, I think there was. Uh, look, I'm not nostalgic for any particular type of even like some of these comedies that we talk about that you couldn't make anymore. Are there any network TV shows that you watch now? Network shows? Um, I mean, we've got three school age kids, and um, <laughs> and we're <laughs> they're like, what? What's what's a network? <laughs> yeah, we're in deep, so we're we don't we don't wa I don't watch as as much as I used to. Yeah. Um, there's stuff that when I do catch it, I like it. I'd, I'd say most of the the stuff that my wife and I kind of make an effort to watch tends to be. Um, uh, either on cable or streaming, streaming yeah those kinds of shows not to say that there aren't network shows that are doing a really great job um but you know i think look you know one of the 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 things the advantages we had in the 90s were and it's, a, it's a very interesting trajectory right because there were a limited number of outlets for things right it was handful of networks and you know movie theaters and um and so yeah, you, you had to really be putting something out there that was worthwhile, right? That the barrier to entry was pretty high because, you know, they'd cancel things pretty quickly if they didn't work. And, and, um, although like Party of Five and Dare I mention us in the same sentences, Seinfeld, you know, there are a lot of examples of shows that wouldn't have seen the light of day, uh, but for the patience of the people running the networks that they were on. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but just getting people's attention anymore in any substantial way has grown to be incredibly challenging. Um, and so I, I feel like this kind of fragmented world that we're in where there's all these channels and all these outlets and all these streaming services, um, you know, to really break through and capture people's attention. In the 90s, you know, I even remember, so I get stopped a lot by people who grew up in Australia because in Australia, they even had less television stations than we had in America. They had like, I don't even know. I don't want to say anything. To, I don't want to be canceled by Australia. I love Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, Australia, Australians no. don't cancel anyone. No. They've got thick skin over okay, there. Good. <laughs> if we, if we can get through this next little while together without me being canceled by a continent, <laughs> I'd, I'd love it. Um, but they maybe only had a couple stations. And so Party of Five was on one of those stations. And so if you had a TV and you were, you know, under 30, you watched the shows that were given to you on those stations. And so, uh, you know, wh whereas there was a certain level of uh, following here in the States, the people in Australia, you know, I go down there and it's like, yeah, it's like uh, Hasselhoff in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're <laughs> Elvis. I'm, I'm Elvis in, uh, in Australia. But, um, but because it was just obviously with that, you know, it was easier to capture an audience because there was an audience sitting there waiting for a good thing. Yeah. Sure. Like the U S in the seventies, there was ABC, CBS, NBC, ABC, right? So like you were either watching uh happy days yeah, or yes. all in the family. I mean, the whole, the whole country was watching the same stuff. That's right. Nice. Do you guys feel like people come through and as you're talking to people, I mean, is there anyone who's like down on the nineties? It's, 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 we have it's, yet to, 
you know, we're only a couple months in, but we have yeah. not, I mean, we, there is, I think a universal nostalgia, at least in, in the guests, and maybe we're just choosing wisely, but we're yeah. gravitating towards the people we loved in the nineties and came up with. And I feel like we all co sort of collectively have that feeling like, like you talked about. And I think it's, you know, a part of sort of the age that we were then, but we've also talked to, um, you know, uh, some younger, some older. And I just think that yeah. it's, it really was just, and David, you say it all the time. It was a more innocent time, right? You, from, from the music to the entertainment, to the, the, you know, all of it. I think you really hit the nail on the head though. Yeah. yeah I, we're, we've been handpicking people that um, came up in the nineties. So they, yeah. you know, they're, they're, uh, the nineties were a good, uh, were very good to our guests. Sure. Um, <laughs> but I think people in general, like even my kids are fascinated with it and people our age are very nostalgic for that time. Um, you know what yeah. I loved seeing you guys, I, I don't mean to like backtrack, but when you talked about the, um, the reunion for White Squall, like just being able to be a fly on the wall and the way you talk about that experience, that collective experience that you all had together, the behind the scenes, getting through a project like that. It was really incredible to just listen to and watch you all reconnect. And I'm sure some of you over the years have come in and out of each other's lives, but to kind of all be together there was a really emotional <laughs> moment as just somebody who had honestly, I, I said I, had, I hadn't, I thought I had seen the movie over the years, but I didn't. I watched it but and I realized I had seen bits and pieces of it, but never had seen it. And I was so blown away by the film, but then getting to see all of you come back together. And when you look at those moments and Jeff hit on it perfectly of like having that experience, an experience like that together and what you take with it, like through the rest of your lives. So that when you come back together 30 plus years later, there's just this like, it's like in your heart, you ha there's a connection that is, it is, it's forever. And I just, it was so powerful to, to witness, you know, just not knowing any of the behind the scenes stories. So I just wanted to say that. I, I, I really feel that's like awesome. that was a beautiful thing. See, that's awesome. And I, I, I felt the same way. I mean, I feel like, um, you know, it reminded me of something that I, I think Jeff said, or uh, Dave, you might've brought it up, but. Uh, and he said it at the time, he was like, you know, the movies that you make, these experiences that you have, you know, the thing itself, um, you make it and then it's handed off and then it's kind of everyone else's, you know, it's still in some way yours. But the thing that's yours forever is the experience you have yep. and the yep. people that you did it with. And to have this kind of special group of people, you know, everyone to a, to to a man and woman that was part of that. Uh, film, you know, led by Jeff uh, in the most beautiful way. And he just, you know, he set the stage for that reunion like 30 years ago, right? Because he instructed all of us in that way, not just by what he said, but how he did what he did. And, you know, you knew that this was a person who cherished his experiences in this, in this world and in this business. And, and that, um, uh, I have, you know, um, I'm sure you guys have too felt the same way. And I've rarely gotten a chance to have a reunion like that, especially after so long. And, um, and especially on something that was really, really beautiful and meaningful and had great depth to it and hit us all at a very early time in our careers where we were exploring and figuring out who we were in this work together. And, um, you know, being led by this, this, uh, Zen master, um, and, and, just, and Ridley as well. Right. Oh I God. mean, uh, yeah. the guy is like, I don't even know how to, how to explain it, but like, uh, he does not stop. Right. He's, oh. he's operating the camera. He's doing his drawings. He sees the entire movie. You know, so between Ridley and Jeff, and then you guys, you know, spending so much time together, yeah month after month it's almost like like um you know being at war with someone or yeah, sure, or being sure. in a frat and fraternity like i know you and i know ethan i know your quirks i you <laughs> know like even though it's years gone by 
you 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 know these people in right. in a way yeah. that that is uh, it's deep and it's and it's lifelong. Yeah, and talk, look, talking to you today, literally, it's like you can snap your fingers and it feels <laughs> like we're hanging off the side of that crazy wagon driving us through the the islands <laughs> uh, with the chickens flying yeah. off the back. But um, one story I didn't uh, I didn't tell I didn't have time to tell about the the white squall thing that I thought was so incredible too because. We've, we've talked a lot about Jeff, but yeah, Ridley, I think, uh, you know, it was intimidating in some ways, right? Working with Ridley because um, he's one of the greatest filmmakers uh, of our time or any time. And so early on, I wasn't getting a whole lot of feedback, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, Ridley, and like you said, he's all in, he's immersed, he's doing the, you know, he operates the camera. Uh, a lot of the time he's, um, he's drawing things out. He's, you know, blocking scenes out. But he cast you for a reason. That's right. You know what I mean? That, that was his, his, his notes to you was giving you the role. That's right. That's right. And I learned that in many ways, we were at dinner one night and Ridley's girlfriend at the time was, was at dinner with us. Janina. And Janina. And earlier that day, uh, or two days prior, um, we had done this scene where all the boys are drunk and they're gathered around this table and they realize they're going to miss the ship and they go mm-hmm. barreling out. Mm-hmm. But there's a moment where uh, Ryan, uh, uh, Philippi's character, has this kind of quiet moment and I kind of clocked it. It wasn't anything that was scripted, but I realized he was having a hard time and I just kind of took him in. And that was part of something that was in the script and that had developed, which was that I had a kinship with him, felt the need to take care of him a little bit. But we, there's this quiet little moment that was like, not again, not in the script, a fleeting little thing that I frankly didn't even know if they shot, you know, but it just got built into the scene. So two nights later, we're at dinner and, and uh, Gene is asking how the thing's going. And he's, and he's like, oh, boy, it's great, 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 great. And yeah, a couple of nights ago in the scene, there's a lovely moment here between these two. It was, yeah, it was great. Oh, he Stop. noticed it. And I was like, whoa, whoa, oh, yeah. whoa, 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 whoa. He sees everything. everything, everything, and so all of that kind of how am I doing? You know, young actors spiraling into the insecurity of the director's not you know telling you that's what's all going you on. needed. I was all I needed. I was like, he's going to see everything that all of us are doing because that's who he is. Yes. That's why he's a master. What and affirmation? So just, yeah, wow. affirmation and just faith that I could just kind of go about my work now and not not uh, worry so much. But but to 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 speak to that. All of it, I, I just this period of time, that film, the shows I did at the time, you know, working on Blossom with you, that whole era, even I would I would say outside of the work, just like being in Los Angeles at the time, mm-hmm. being in Hollywood at the time <laughs> and going out with friends and I, everything just felt like it it carried that sense of innocence and commitment to the right things. People were there and, and, and aspiring to be artists and tell stories and but there was sort of a safety and and an innocence that that i i don't know that i hope the kids and the younger people that are arriving today you know feel some sense of that but well i think I, it, for, uh, I think for us too i mean we didn't have cell phones or internet or any of those things to, so so the in between times the audition like i remember thinking back that like there was a lot of if if you know, because David and I had done Hey Dude and I'd done a lot of commercials, I didn't have to come and get a job right away. I had some money. Yeah. I could come and to L.A. and just sort of audition and see how it all went. And but there was a lot of downtime between the Blossom episodes yeah. and the Saved by the Bell episodes and yeah, and those right. moments that's that right. were big, like big deals. But um, yeah. we had to connect. We had to connect with other human beings for mm-hmm. entertainment. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, of course you could take yourself to a movie or something, but you had to go out to do that. You had to, you were not. And I just even remember our friends, like during, you know, in between jobs, we would, you know, now it's pickleball, but we would go out and play paddle tennis and everyone would talk about their, I'm up for this pilot or I'm testing for this or I'm, you know, oh. and whilst we're like hitting the ball, like it was, I feel like that's what something about that I miss is that is the, because believe me, I can isolate and I, sure. I, I especially as a mom where it's like, nobody's home. Sure. I'm like, please, this is my time, my <laughs> space. The band camp part Exactly. Of it. Yes, exactly. You can still play tennis and pickleball. Oh, no, no, no. You just, no, no, no. I yeah. just mean the different, like what we would do to kill time between. Whereas, 
you you look at Chelsea, everybody's right. on TikTok, everybody's yeah, on social media. True. They're putting yep. videos out there. They're creating their own stuff too, which I think is great. We didn't have a lot of, you know, um, access or outlets for those sort of things. Even if you were being creative, it, you didn't necessarily know it would be seen the way it is today. But no, yeah. I think that's that was what was so fun is being able yeah. to sort of make a plan with people. Like, you, like you said, time. hanging yeah. out in the LA scene, yeah. those restaurants or those bars that we all went yeah. to that we all know, you know? Not yeah, not not in isolation, but exactly. But in community. Yeah. yeah. We didn't mention the movie Go. I mean, your 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 work has oh, been amazing. Such a and, good one. And, and I have to say, yeah, that I remember when you did that movie and I was like, whoa, this guy came to play again. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you, man. Yeah, you want to talk real quick about that movie? Well, I mean, look, it was just it was another one uh that the writing was incredible, the cast yep. was incredible, and um and yeah, felt like you know, we pushed some boundaries, you know, that was, that was still in that era where we, uh, we could really kind of push some boundaries and, and, um, and tell a pretty far out story for, for a bunch of characters. <laughs> at those ages. And it was, just, it was Tarantino-esque, right? Before, it was, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Doug Lyon did an yes. amazing job with that. Your storyline, that storyline was so great. So great. I just, that was, dinner scene is like, stays with you <laughs> that, 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 yeah. that, at the table and the, totally. yes, yeah, Bill Fisher, he was incredible. Um, yeah. Thank you for the kind words, man. I, I feel so lucky to have been, have been given the opportunity to tell some amazing stories and, um, and still do. And so, uh, yeah, long live the nineties. Long live the nineties. Well, congrats on Nancy Drew premiering in a couple months, right? Um, and enjoy your beautiful fa beautiful family in Park City. I mean, yes. what an amazing place to ra to bring up your kids, man. Thank you. We thank can't you, thank, thank you, you thank enough you for coming enough. back. Thank you. Oh, man, you're awesome. I'll come back uh, anytime. Great. All right. Wh <laughs> when you're in L.A., please, let's try and get together. We'll get the whole gang, you know? Yes. And in person. Yes, okay. for sure. For sure. For sure. All you right. Thank you, so Scotty. So much love. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye, buddy. Bye. Well, that was awesome. Oh, he's such a dear. <laughs> he, really, he really is. Again, man. for somebody that I don't know well at all, but, you know, feel like I know just from watching him over the years and his work. Um, it's just you, he's the kind of person you just feel like you want to be. I want that person in my life. That's a great energy and such a, a just a kind human being, you know, who is really deeply appreciative of. The opportunities he's had but like you said at the very beginning i mean and he talked about it and i had never heard that story about him being an extra on oh, set oh yeah that he to just that he from day one would show up on sets and and observe everything you know and that is not what everybody does and so he's he is yeah. a lifelong learner and i feel like he still is just just having he is a sweet genuine like good good guy but uh, very focused, mm -hmm. as we spoke about in the in the intro. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I always knew that about him. The, he 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 comes, he shows up to work, and he's he's about his business when he's on set. And I'm not surprised that he, you know, he was an extra, you know, bothering the ads about like what what are you doing now? That's so great. So that he could learn, yeah. you know. I mean, and that's great um, advice. I feel like that's all that I do get. Have people ask like, what do you? What's the best advice to get into this business? And his, what he said, he tells people is get on sets, you know, whether and and sort of swallow your ego in whatever form it is. Get on a set and just kind of take it all in and learn and watch. And I feel like that is really, really um, sage advice. Um, and now we should have asked him some of the things he was an extra in because we should have gone back. <laughs> It'd be fun to try oh, to spot him in the background. I think he said. Did I he think say? He said, did he say uh, the show? Uh, Fresh Prince, maybe. Oh, it I don't was know. Fresh Prince, right? I, but I, oh, I thought he meant that he was like working on Fresh Prince, but maybe he was. Maybe he was a background artist on Fresh. Prince. I don't know. But when 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 we hear when we listen back to the episode, yes, I think he did be, mention yes. which shows, and uh, yeah, he's just been. You know, like, look, we talk about longevity. He's been working for 30 years. He's kind. He's genuine. He's respectful. He's he's curious and he loves his craft. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is we're just so lucky with our guests. We really right? are. It's been so much fun. And we've got um a really good one next week. But let's not tell. Let's not tell. I think it's more fun to make people yeah, wait and come I, back. Cause okay. no. You think? No. 
Uh, <laughs> no, yeah, don't say. No, don't say. Don't say. Because now we've built up the anticipation even more. I hope our listeners trust our taste <laughs> in guests because I could not be prouder. If you look through um, our episodes or even through our social media posts, uh, the Hey Dude, the 90s called, it's just an amazing uh, lineup of, yes. of, of talent. Yes. And and also, I mean, as somebody who is not really on social media, and that's we'll save that for another time because I <laughs> feel like now that I have actually a show where we are regularly talking to two people. Oh, no. And I'm not you saying are going to go public I'm not on saying, Instagram. I'm not, I know I'm you not are. not saying I'm going public on You're... Instagram yet. Okay. But I am. It is food for thought because I um, really love looking up at, at the, you know, the fans and the people that are listening um, to their feedback. And people are suggesting guests. And you, you're like you're really paying us such sweet compliments. So any of you who are listening and have stayed listening, we really appreciate it. And, um, and yeah, we'll keep, we we'll really keep it do. coming and keep the ideas coming for us. Yeah. Any we guest ideas, po- post them post on them. Um, at Hey Dude, the 90s called on Instagram. And yeah, we love our listeners. We love our guests. And I love seeing you, Christine. And I love you, David. <laughs> and we'll see you next week. Uh, have a great rest of the week. Mwah. Bye, everyone. Bye, sweetie. Thanks for listening. Make sure to subscribe and give us five stars. And please follow us on Instagram at Hey Dude, the 90s called. See you next time.